Over a century ago, Australia tried to redraw its own map by flooding the desert and creating an inland sea the size of a country. But how do you turn one of the driest places on Earth into an ocean? To answer that, we need to go back to the start, when explorers believed a mysterious inland sea already existed, hidden in the heart of Australia. Australia has always lived under the rule of water, or the lack of it. Most of the continent is arid or semi-arid, with rainfall clustered along the coasts, while northern rivers can flood so heavily they burst their banks. The interior remains bone dry for most of the year. This imbalance shapes everything. Farms collapse under drought, inland towns shrink, and entire regions are forced to rely on costly pipelines and dams. At the same time, tropical Queensland receives torrential monsoon rains that wash out to sea every summer. It's here that the inland sea dream takes hold. The problem looked simple on paper. Too much water in the north, too little in the center. If engineers could just move that water south and west, the outback might bloom, droughts might end, and Australia could open up millions of hectares of new farmland. But making that vision real would require one of the boldest engineering projects ever attempted. When Europeans first began exploring Australia's interior in the 1800s, they carried a powerful assumption. Somewhere beyond the coast, there had to be a great inland sea. Many of the world's continents had central lakes or rivers, so surely Australia's desert hit a similar prize. Explorer Charles Sturt was so convinced that in 1829 he dragged boats deep into the outback, expecting to find a vast inland ocean. Instead, he found blistering heat, endless salt pans, and almost no water at all. The inland sea was a mirage, a myth that collapsed under the weight of reality. But the idea never died. If nature hadn't given Australia an inland sea, perhaps engineers could build one. By the late 1800s, figures like Sir Richard Baker investigated whether Lake Eyre, the lowest point in Australia, could be deliberately flooded. Attention turned to Lake Eyre, a vast salt basin in South Australia that sometimes filled with water after rare, heavy rains. When it did, it became one of the largest temporary lakes on Earth. Larger than Belgium, a shimmering inland ocean in the middle of the desert. And then, within months, it would vanish again, leaving behind cracked salt and silence. To visionaries, that fleeting transformation proved a point. If water could be brought here permanently, the outback could be remade. The most famous attempt came in the 1930s from engineer John Job Crew Bradfield. Bradfield was already a national hero for helping design the Sydney Harbour Bridge, but he wanted to go bigger. His Bradfield scheme proposed diverting rivers from Queensland's rainy north, the Tully, the Herbert, and the Burdekin, and sending that water over the Great Dividing Range into the arid interior. From there, it would flow into the Thompson River system and eventually into Lake Eyre, creating a permanent inland sea. Bradfield believed this would do more than irrigate farms. He argued that filling Lake Eyre could even increase rainfall and cool the climate across central Australia. In his vision, the dead heart of the continent would be reborn, supporting millions more people and vast new agricultural industries. The scheme captured the public's imagination. Newspapers ran bold headlines, politicians debated it, and Australians dreamed of a green interior. But experts raised doubts almost immediately. They pointed out that Bradfield had overestimated the amount of water available in those rivers, in some cases by more than double. Others argued that the climate effects he promised were speculative at best. By the 1940s, official reviews dismissed the plan as impractical. Still, the dream refused to die. In 1941, author Ion Idris published The Great Boomerang, reviving the concept in popular culture. In the 1950s, new proposals surfaced to cut a canal from South Australia's Spencer Gulf all the way to Lake Eyre, a trench hundreds of kilometers long that could flood the basin with seawater. But surveys quickly revealed that the terrain between the gulf and the basin sat above sea level, meaning water wouldn't flow naturally. Engineers calculated that the canal would need to be at least 300 kilometers long, 1.5 kilometers wide, and deep enough to handle evaporation losses of more than two meters a year. Even then, the result would likely be a vast, salty evaporation pan. 
time and again, the schemes collapsed under the same weight. Enormous cost, technical impossibility, and questionable science. Yet every few decades, whenever drought returned, so did the dream of an inland sea. In the early 2000s, when Australia was struggling through one of its worst droughts on record, Queensland Premier Peter Beattie floated the notion of revisiting Bradfield's plan. It made the news, but quickly faded when experts pointed out the same old flaws. A decade later, during the devastating 2019 drought, the inland sea surged back into headlines. Pauline Hansen demanded the government fund a hybrid Bradfield scheme, claiming it would save inland farmers. John Barillaro, New South Wales's deputy premier, announced $25 million for a feasibility study. In Queensland, the opposition Liberal National Party went even further, making a revived Bradfield scheme part of its state election campaign. Hope filled the air again, especially in farming regions where families were desperate for water. Maps were redrawn showing canals slicing across Queensland, dams rising in the tropics, and Lake Eyre shimmering as a permanent inland sea. For a moment, the vision of Bradfield's inland ocean felt alive again. But just as in Bradfield's time, scientists and economists began dismantling the proposals. The CSIRO released assessments showing that the water simply wasn't there in the volumes needed. Northern rivers weren't a tap to be turned on. Their flows were seasonal and already crucial to wetlands, fisheries, and the Great Barrier Reef. Removing that water inland would devastate ecosystems that depended on those floods. Cost was another killer. Modern estimates put the price of a revived Bradfield scheme at tens of billions of dollars, not including the enormous energy required to pump water uphill over the Great Dividing Range. Even if built, the cost of the water delivered to inland farms would be far higher than any crops could support. In 2022, a government-commissioned panel led by economist Ross Garnout delivered the most comprehensive review yet. After a year of study, the verdict was blunt. The inland sea doesn't hold water. The panel concluded the plan was uneconomic, environmentally damaging, and scientifically flawed. Instead, it recommended smaller, regional projects, dams, pipelines, and recycling systems designed around existing rainfall rather than trying to bend nature to human will. Despite the science, the inland sea still has political appeal. Figures like long-serving MP Bob Catter continue to champion it, calling it essential for nation-building. To many voters in rural Queensland, the Inland Sea represents hope, a promise that governments won't abandon them to drought. That symbolism makes it a powerful talking point, even if experts dismiss it as fantasy. This cycle has now repeated for almost a century. Drought brings back the dream, politicians promise it, Feasibility studies reject it and the idea fades until the next drought. But hope alone doesn't change geography. To understand why every review has failed, you have to look at the engineering itself and ask whether such a project is even possible. The Inland Sea Dream sounds bold on paper, but when you start looking at the details, the sheer scale of the engineering becomes overwhelming. Lake Eyre, the Great Basin at the center of these schemes, does sit below sea level, which makes it look like a natural candidate. But the water that would feed it doesn't sit conveniently uphill and ready to flow. The rivers of the north empty eastward into the Coral Sea, blocked by the Great Dividing Range. To get that water inland, you would need to pump it up and over the mountains, moving it across hundreds of kilometers before it ever reached the basin. That alone is staggering. To put it in perspective, the pumps required would consume as much power as a city the size of Adelaide. They would have to run constantly, day and night, for decades. Then there's the construction itself, dams rising across the north, canals and pipelines stretching for thousands of kilometers, tunnels cut through rock, all designed to move water in volumes Australia has never attempted before. The Snowy Mountains Scheme, the country's largest engineering project, built 145 kilometers of tunnels over 25 years. The Inland Sea would demand nearly 10 times that effort. It's the difference between building a landmark and trying to reshape an entire continent. Even if you solved the problem of getting the water there, you would still have to fight evaporation. Central Australia is one of the driest places on Earth, with annual evaporation rates of around 2.5 meters. A permanent inland sea would vanish rapidly unless replenished by a constant inflow. Keeping it full would mean pouring in billions of liters each year, every year, forever. Stop even briefly, and the sea shrinks back into a salty pan. 
Inside the desert, the story isn't any simpler. Filling lake air permanently would create new habitats for birds and aquatic life, yes, but it would also destroy existing desert ecosystems that have adapted to cycles of boom and bust. Species that thrive on the rhythms of dry years and sudden floods would vanish. And if seawater was used, the problem of salinity would become catastrophic. As the water evaporated, salt would concentrate, leaving behind enormous salt flats and toxic dust storms. This is why every government review from 1947 to today has rejected the plan. And yet, the inland sea refuses to die. Politicians continue to raise it because it captures something no small-scale project can. Imagination. It sounds grand. It sounds heroic. For communities trapped in drought, it feels like salvation. And so, even knowing it is flawed, the inland sea remains a powerful symbol. Culturally, it has become part of Australia's story. The myth of a hidden inland sea drove explorers like Sturt into the desert. Bradfield's scheme made it a blueprint for national ambition. Later generations turned it into a political football, sometimes mocked as a fantasy, sometimes defended as bold nation building. However, Australia is not the only country to dream of reshaping nature on this scale. Around the world, governments have tried grand water diversions, some successful, others disastrous. In the United States, California's deserts were transformed by massive aqueducts bringing water hundreds of kilometers from the Sierra Nevada. Towns like Los Angeles grew into global cities because water was moved, where it never naturally flowed. Yet the same system also created environmental crises, draining rivers, shrinking wetlands, and leaving the once mighty Salton Sea as a toxic, salty lake. In the Soviet Union, planners diverted rivers in Central Asia to irrigate cotton fields. For a time, it looked like success, but the result was the collapse of the Aral Sea, once the fourth largest lake on Earth. Today, it's a barren salt flat, these global examples show both sides of the equation. With enough money and political will, desserts can be turned green, at least for a while. But the environmental price can be catastrophic, and the cost of maintaining artificial systems grows every year. So the question remains, if Australia faced an even harsher climate future, with droughts deeper and rivers drier, would leaders dare to try again? Or is it wiser to accept that some visions belong only on paper? The inland sea may never be built, but as long as drought and flood define Australia's story, the dream will keep surfacing, shimmering like a mirage on the horizon. And maybe that's its real purpose, not to fill lake air, but to remind us of the scale of the challenge and of the imagination people summon when confronted with it.